Welcome into my gated community. You can call me the doorman. And here, I'd like to share with you some of the stories of how some of our, let's say, guests ended up here. Tonight's story is about the pizza bomber. It's a lot of moving parts, and I want to share with you the major players and the timeline of events here. Check this out. Ken Barnes, a fishing buddy of Marjorie D.L. Armstrong and a drug dealer who ran a crack house on Perry Street in Erie, testified against D.L. Armstrong at trial in exchange for a plea deal. He pleaded guilty in September 2008 of using a destructive device during a crime of violence and conspiracy to commit bank robbery. He got a 45-year sentence in December 2008, but after his testimony and D.L. Armstrong's conviction, the judge halved his sentence in 2011. Barnes added to the bizarre case by testifying that he participated in the pizza bomber plot, which included a bank robbery so that Deal Armstrong can raise the $250,000 to pay him to kill her father so he would stop spending her inheritance money. Quote, If you kill my father, I'll give you the money from the bank robbery. Barnes testified about what Deal Armstrong told him. I'll show you the money. He pleaded guilty in the pizza bomber case. He had a prison release date of September 10th, 2027. He suffered from heart disease and severe diabetes, and he died in prison before that date came. James Roden, 45 years of age, was Marjorie's boyfriend at the time of the pizza bombing plot, and he had been living with Deal Armstrong for 10 years. He allegedly threatened to rat Marjorie out to the police, which is apparently when she shot him twice with a shotgun while he slept. The murder occurred sometime between August 11th and August 13th of 2003. Now, Brian Wells, he's the one that actually wore the collar, the rube as I call him, um, he was in it to some degree because he told the cops that a group of black men forced the collar on him and forced him to rob the bank. Because if he had no part in the crime, there would have been no problem telling the police the truth. And a group of black men that forced the collar on him was an absolute lie. Bill Rothstein, a two-time ex-fiance of Marjorie Deal Armstrong, he was always the smartest guy in the room. Yeah, Bill Rothstein, smartest guy in the room. See what I mean? First one, do you understand the rights I have explained to you? Yes, except for one thing, there should be a D after that word used. It can and will be used against you in a court of law. There's a typo error. He had a Mensa level IQ and had the skills to make the bomb. Marjorie offered him $2,000 to get rid of Rodden's body. A freezer and a grinder were purchased, but Rothstein got cold feet, called the police to report Marjorie's crime, as well as his part in the cover up. There's an hour and 50 minute video of Bill Rothstein speaking with police on the James Roden murder. I'll link that below. As police are searching Rothstein's place, they find a suicide note written by Rothstein that read, The body in the freezer has nothing to do with the Wells case. In the police video from the crime scene, Rothstein asks investigators, Did you guys get my note? Just wanted to be sure you don't think this had anything to do with the Wells case. Consequently, Rothstein's house, strangely enough, bordered the driveway to the TV antenna where the pizza bomber's pizzas were delivered. The so-called mastermind of the pizza bomber case, Marjorie Deal Armstrong, she was responsible for three murders in her past. In 1984, she shot her boyfriend, Robert Thomas, six times while he slept. She was ultimately found not guilty on the grounds he was allegedly violent and abusive towards her. In August 2003, she kills Rodden, shooting him twice with a shotgun while he slept. Testimony from Bill Rothstein gets her put in prison for the, his murder. Inmates testified against her in the pizza bomber case, saying she had bragged about killing her boyfriend, Rodden, saying she did it to keep him quiet about the pizza bombing plot. It took eight police officers a whopping four days to get rid of the mess she collected, and they filled up six dumpsters with trash. Just after 1.30 p.m. on August 28, 2003, Mamma Mia's Pizzeria receives a call from a payphone in a nearby gas station. Brian Wells took the order for two small sausage and pepperoni pizzas for delivery at 8631 Peach Street, an address a few miles away from the pizzeria. The address was the location of the transmitting tower of WSEE-TV at the end of a dirt road. Strangely enough, the house on the corner of the access road belonged to Bill Rothstein. At 2.28 p.m., the middle-aged pizza delivery man Brian Wells walked into a PNC bank in Erie, Pennsylvania. He had a short cane in his right hand and a strange bulge on his neck and chest under a loosely fitting t-shirt. Wells passed the teller a note which said, Gather employees with access codes to the vault 
and work fast to fill the bag with $250,000. You only have 15 minutes. Then he lifted his shirt to reveal the box-like device dangling from his neck. According to the note, it was a bomb. The teller, who told Wells there was no way to get into the vault in time, filled the bag with $8,700 and handed it over. Wells walked out, sucking on a dum-dum lollipop he grabbed from the counter. Police catch up with Wells as he was not far from the bank. They searched his car and found the letters with the scavenger hunt clues. At this point, the bomb squad is called, and the police are hanging back waiting while the bomb is ticking. Literally. He was getting excited, and then I kept hearing that it, you know, it was going beep, beep. That was zoomed in right on his face. The bomb ripped a five-inch gash in his chest and he was killed immediately. The bomb squad had arrived three minutes after the bomb goes off. Police scour the eight-page scavenger hunt list that Brian Wells was told to follow if he wanted to live. Now the police said they followed this list and the next clue was missing, but they also said that if he had made all the clues and did everything right, the bomb still would have went off. So my thought is, how were they supposed to get their money back if the bomb was going to go off with Brian anyways? Say they got the 250000 from the bank, he would have blown up anyways. You know, for if Marjorie, I can understand if it was her planning, but Bill Rothstein was a smart guy. I just can't believe he would put together this plan that had a, a failed ending. So about a month after the pizza bomber case, Bill Rothstein calls 911 to report there's a body in his garage in a freezer. He elaborates that Marjorie Dale Armstrong was the murderer and he was just helping her clean up. Um, they arrest Marjorie on that notion. They go back to Rothstein and ask him, does he know anything about the Wells case? And he said he may have used the payphone on the day of the murder, which is interesting. Um, he ends up dying in end of July 2004, so even on his deathbed, he told nothing to the police about the Wells case. With Rothstein and Wells both dead, the police played Deal Armstrong and Barnes against each other, and they got Barnes to admit that Deal Armstrong wanted the whole thing done so she could pay Barnes to kill her father, who she thought was spending all of her inheritance money. Strange, strange case. Well, thanks for watching. We'll see you next Visitor's Day. I am the doorman, and don't let me catch you in my gated community.